would like to welcome everyone. My name is Megan Matheson. I am the co-lead of the Canadian Marine Shipping Risk Forum, and I'm also the Director of Strategy and Engagement for Claire Seas. And before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that I am joining from the traditional ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations, and express my gratitude for their stewardship of these lands and waters since time immemorial. For a few introductions, the Canadian Marine Shipping Risk Forum is a community of practice that's hosted by MEOPAR, the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network, and Claire Seas. This community of practice is open to all who are interested in the work of understanding and mitigating shipping risk. And thank you very much for joining us at our second session in our 2023 webinar series focused on technology and shipping risk. If you happen to have missed the first session on satellite technology, I will drop a link to it in the chat so that you can check it out uh, later on. And this series of webinars that we're running is investigating different ways that technology is being applied to the marine environment with a particular focus on the activity and impacts of vessels that are not using automatic identification system transponders. As a result of this knowledge sharing, we're hoping community of practice members can apply these technologies in new ways to address information needs for a safer marine environment. And this particular session focuses on the ways that aerial technology is being applied to the marine environment. We're going to go through the presentations and there'll be time for questions following each presentation and you are welcome to use the Q&A function. Um, there's a Q&A button on your screen. You can type your question in there or if you'd prefer, um, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you so that you can ask your question directly. Um, so either, either approach is great. For our agenda today, we're going to start, uh, we'll have our first presentation starting shortly. There'll be time for questions. We'll take a short break have our second presentation, again, time for questions, another short break, and we'll, we'll wrap it up with our third presentation starting at uh, 11.15. So introductions of our panelists. Uh, we are first going to hear from Norma Sarasogas, who is an environmental analyst with the Oceans Protection Plan at Transport Canada. And her work involves developing systems and methods for collecting and analyzing vessel information to inform the assessment of vessel activities and their potential impacts to marine and coastal environments, including vessels that don't use AIS. Her interests include coastal conservation planning and management and environmental impact assessments. Norma has a master's in science from the University of Victoria and was previously a research associate for over 10 years with the Coral Research Group. She is originally from Barcelona in Spain and now lives in beautiful Victoria, British Columbia with her husband and daughter. And Norma will be presenting with Jorge Chiano, a, a project scientist with JASCO Applied Sciences. And he has been with JASCO since 2016. And he conducts research on anthropogenic noise modeling and deconvolution techniques for acoustic source information and characterization. He received a degree in electrical engineering from the Instituto Tecnologico de Costa Rica in 2001 and his master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Portland State University in Portland, Oregon in 20, 2006 and 2010, respectively. Uh, from 2004 to 2010, he was a research assistant with the Northwest Electromagnetics and Acoustics Research Laboratory in Portland. And then from 2010 to 2015, he was a research associate with the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of Victoria, where he conducted research on seabed geoacoustic inversion technologies, adaptive beamforming for large aperture sonar arrays, and computationally efficient methods for underwater acoustic modeling. I hope I'm not the only one who understands what those words mean individually, but not necessarily when they're all strung together like that. I'm going to hand it over to Norma and Jorge to enlighten us and uh, enjoy their presentation. Thank you so much, Megan. So I'm gonna go and try to share my screen. Um, yeah, all good, Megan, you see it? Looks great, go ahead. Awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen people, also known as Songhees and Squamish Nation and the Wasanic peoples, so here in Victoria. Um, so before I start, I would like to set some context. Um, so why uh, I'm gonna be talking about using aerial surveys to collect vessel traffic information if we have access to sometimes uh, AIS data. Well, um, the situation is that AIS data alone 
doesn't capture all vessel traffic. AAS is only required on vessels 20 meters or more in length or on passenger vessels, uh, vessels eight meters or more in length. So as we see, not all vessel uh, traffic is, is captured in, in AIS data. And why is this important to know what, uh, what is not captured in AIS? What, what are we missing? Because uh, if we only rely on AIS data uh, and, and we don't understand its limitation, we can uh, lead to, we can lead to um, incomplete understanding of actual risk of threats that the vessel activities pose to the marine environment particularly from small vessels. So aerial surveys is one way to collect vessel traffic information independently if the vessel is equipped or transmitting AIS. And so this is what I'm gonna be talking today. Um, so here is uh, NASP. So uh, I've been collaborating with the National Aerial Surveillance Program uh, that is operated by Transport Canada to conduct the surveys. So historically, um, uh, NASP has been used as a principal tool for monitoring and enforcement international and national pollution regulations in Canadian waters. However, NASP activities also expands to emergency response, ice reconnaissance, marine security, wildlife monitoring, fisheries patrol, and many others, so they're quite busy. Um, this picture is of the aircraft that NASP uh, uses in uh, the Pacific region. The NAF aircraft is uh, equipped with an array of instruments and sensors, initially designed to monitor and detect all pollution on the surface of the water. But we're taking advantage of those, some of these instrumentation, instruments to collect information on vessel traffic. Uh, we use um, a, a camera system mounted under the plane, which allows for the identification of vessels during different light conditions. And also be using an AIS receiver, which capture real-time vessel information on vessels um, of vessels equipped with AIS. Surveys are conducted during uh, good visual flying conditions and last about 10 minutes. Uh, survey routes are planned in advance and are selected based on inputs from the surveillance officers and NADA needs. Information coming from the camera system um, and the AIS receiver is displayed um, and available to the uh, surveillance officers inside the aircraft. The surveillance officer is then able to manipulate the camera and collect imagery of vessels that are not displayed on their AIS screen. So I'm going to show you a video that showcases how a vessel traffic survey is, uh, is conducted and how the data is collected. This survey is, um, this video is from uh, the Squally Channel in the north coast of BC. On your left, you'll see uh, the view of the imagery, imagery coming in from the camera system. And on the right, uh, you have a screenshot of the AIS targets captured at the time of the survey. And there are these in this kind of blue triangles. The orange line and shaded orange area represent the survey track line and area surveyed by NASP. So I'm gonna play the video. So they play the video, you'll see how the surveillance operates, officer operates the camera and captures the vessels not observed on the AIS visual display. So that will be the first one, non-AIS vessel. And in this case, um, I identified as a pleasure craft. And I signal the location um, on the map. So the location is also available in the video, uh, which is the one here in the bottom. Now it's looking at that vessel, but that vessel says that it's actually an AIS vessel. So, um, so I know that now, and then there will be another third vessel here. Uh, it zooms in another recreational boat, uh, pressure craft, also non-AIS. So by the end of this survey, uh, there was 12 non-AIS pressure craft sightings and two AIS pressure crafts that were identified on the AIS display. So all this data, the video, the track data, screenshots of the AIS target, targets, uh, it's uh, packaged and, and compiled and sent to me for further analysis. The, uh, these are some screenshots of the type of vessels observed by NASP in, um, in the Pacific coast, and they're not required to carry AIS. So the, through these images and the video, I can identify the type of vessels and also the activity they engage in. It's more difficult to accurately estimate the speed of the vessel and, or the size. 
This map shows the frequency and coverage of NAS vessel surveys from 2015 to 2022. Um, services started in the south coast of BC in 2015 and continued until 2019. Then surveys expanded to the north coast of Vancouver Island and waterways along the central and all the way to Prince Rupert. Um, surveys are actually still ongoing in the, in the north coast at this point. So data from these surveys can be uh, presented in a number of ways, but because of the time, uh, I don't have a lot, uh, I will be providing a high level summary of the fishing and recreation vessel traffic observed by NASP in the areas highlighted here in the, in the map for those yellow boxes. So these graphs represent the number of recreational vessels and fishing vessels sighted during the time period noted here. Um, it also, I included the percentage to show the proportion of AIS and non-AIS vessels within each region and vessel type. So we can see right away that all areas show a higher number of recreational vessels than fishing vessels. But also um, more importantly and more interesting is that the, uh, we observe a higher number of non-AIS vessels. Um, it's much higher than AIS vessels for both vessel types. Um, but when if we look a little closer, we can see the proportion of non-AIS and AIS vessels uh, is different um, when we look at the different regions. For example, on the North Coast, the has the highest proportion of recreational non-AIS vessels with 94% of all recreational vessels observed being non-AIS. Um, these values can change if we break down these areas into smaller areas or by reason or by uh, season. So for example, a higher number of non-AS vessels are sighted during the summer months than during the winter. So I will stop here and I'm gonna invite uh, Jorge Quijano from JASCO to present the work that JASCO completed using the data provided from NAS vessel surveys. The work involved the modeling of underwater noise from vessel traffic for several areas of interest <clears throat> highlighted in the figure here and commissioned by the Community Effects of Marine Shipping Initiative by Transport Canada. I provided a link, but also a QR code if you want to learn more about this initiative. Jorge will uh, specifically talk about the results of Area 2 here in the North, uh, North Vancouver Island. So all yours now, Jorge. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I want to start with this. Uh, this is a high level uh, summary of uh, what our model does. Uh, the name of the model is uh, Artemia. And uh, basically it is a model that allows us to generate two dimensional maps of the uh, noise footprint uh, generated by a collection of uh, moving sources that are floating. So in this case, we consider each vessel as a point source and uh, each vessel depending on their category is gonna be characterized by a frequency dependent uh, uh, propagation or uh, as a source uh, as a source of, uh, of noise with a different uh, frequency dependency. So those curves that you see out there, those are uh, averages of uh, lots and lots of measurements that we have uh, collected, and each one represents one type of vessel. Uh, we also adjust if the vessel goes faster, then it's slightly louder than if it goes uh, very slow. Uh, the model also takes uh, environmental inputs, uh, such as uh, the bathymetry of the area, the seabed type, and the sound speed profile, which is the one plotted there to the left. And uh, for this uh, research, we, we were using three representative sound speed profiles for, for each season, each of the three seasons. Uh, using that, we apply the parabolic equation method to estimate what is called the, the propagation loss, which uh, tells how the sound is going to decrease as we move away from each of the vessels. And uh, another, environmental input to this model is the uh, is, uh, data about wind and rain, because that is what is going to dominate the background noise. So for example, if you have a strong storm or a very uh, a fast wind, usually that translates into a peak of uh, ambient noise uh, in, the, in any measured data. So uh, to account for the spatial distribution of those point sources, we are using the information from AIS that gives us the latitude, longitude, and the timestamp for each of the vessels at each minute. And uh, we uh, we apply a lot of uh, different methods to uh, to do data quality for this AIS. For example, to remove uh, uh, tracks that don't make a physical sense. For example, a vessel going too fast 
or vessels crossing land. So we sanitize this data um, a lot, and then we, we end up with a with a good set of AIS tracks that can be used for modeling. And uh, here is where the collaboration with uh, with the NASP project uh, uh, begins. We we took the outputs of uh, from Norma's uh, investigation, and we tried to come up with a way to uh, create or generate uh, simulated tracks. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, for 2019, we, we knew that larger vessels were uh, well represented. So the, the main issue here were uh, fishing, recreational and talks, smaller vessels. And uh, uh, what we got is the ratio of the number of non-AIS vessels to the number of AIS vessels for each category and uh, each uh, region. And uh, the idea was to use this ratio to generate a new set of uh, non-AIS tracks that will represent the, the this type of uh, traffic. Uh, next slide. So uh, we focus on this uh, area that I'm highlighting there. It's called the Johnston Strait. And uh, well, the, this area was selected because it's one of the ones with more uh, surveys. So we have a, a higher confidence on the statistical significance of these uh, calculation for these uh, ratios. And uh, these uh, numbers in red are the ones that the Norma, Norma provided to us. Uh, it's the ratio of non the number of non-AIS vessels to AIS. So for example, if you take a fishing type and uh, during summer, this tells that if we, that whatever number of fishing AIS vessels we have, we should expect 2.63 times more uh, for the non-AIS traffic. So using this idea, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we applied this uh, four-step uh, uh, procedure to generate our tracks. So first we take the, un the number of unique tracks that we have in the area, which is capital M. Notice that each of those, uh, sorry, not, not unique tracks, unique vessels. Uh, notice that each of those vessels can have uh, multiple tracks or just one. The next step uh, will be to compute how many new tracks we need to uh, to represent the non-AIS. So that will be M times the ratios that, that uh, I showed in the previous slide. And uh, once we know how many new tracks, we do a random uh, draw with replacement from the original uh, uh, set of unique vessels. So with replacement means that we can select uh, the same vessel multiple times, but this is all done uh, randomly. And uh, that way we get a new set of uh, tracks, non-AIS tracks, but we didn't want them to overlap exactly with the original ones. So we are adding a random perturbation uh, to the timestamp and also to the uh, position. So for the timestamp, we are adding a, uh, using a normal distribution with a standard deviation of half day. And for the uh, position, uh, normal distribution with 50 meter standard deviation. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, here is an example of the outputs. Uh, uh, in the bottom, we have the original uh, modeling. This is just the AIS traffic, but it includes all categories. And uh, on top is just the non AIS traffic. So this is uh, the result of a uh, uh, simulated tracks, and it only includes fishing, recreational, and talks. And uh, well, you can see difference in fine scale. Like for example, in the in the northern channels, you see a little difference, little tracks that uh, doesn't don't show up in one or the other. But uh, in general, when you take uh, any any uh, location and you see what is the SPL level, you will see that they are comparable, which uh, suggests that the non-AIS traffic is uh, is indeed a, a relevant uh, contribution to the total uh, noise. And uh, this is a, an additional motivation to keep uh, investigating into this type of, uh, of uh, technology and how to account for this type of traffic. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Um, just to summarize, these are some uh, points that kind of I, want, I thought of highlighting. So what we learned so far is that non-AIS vessel traffic is dominated by recreational boating and fishing vessel traffic in the Pacific coast. Proportions of non-AIS AIS vessels are not the same across BC, similar but not exactly the same, uh, or within vessel types. Majority of non-AIS vessels are observed during the summer months, and but there is a uh, data gaps in in um, offshore areas, uh, west coast of Vancouver Island, and, and Haida Wai. So I'm trying to figure out ways to to fill those in. 
Aerospace, uh, there is advantages. Clearly, uh, it's a way to collect vessel information regardless uh, AS carriage requirements. It, you can cover large areas and you can survey areas that are uh, remote and difficult to access. However, it just provides a, snapshot, a snapshot in time. Uh, data collection is rather uh, dependent. So if the visual conditions are not ideal, then, it, then surveys don't take place. And it can be expensive if you don't have uh, already an agreement. Um, and basically kind of highlight uh, and showcase how NAS uh, vessel traffic data uh, can be used to vendor the set threats from vessel activities, particularly from small vessels like recreational vessels. And I wanted just to finish with uh, our contact information. Um, also wanted to bring up this um, uh, article that was published, we published a, a few years ago and where you can learn more about the methodology and the results from the South Coast um, data collection or surveys. And I think that's it from my end. I'll, uh, I'll leave this slide for a minute or two, but uh, yeah, um, if there's any questions, happy to answer. Thank you, Norma and Jorge. That's great and fascinating that you can make use of uh, a plane and, and zoom in to that extent. The video was really interesting to see. Thank you for sharing that, Norma. I wanted to clarify, just as we start off the questions, we do have a few from the audience, which is great. So we'll go through those. Um, when you look at the non-AIS vessels, are you assuming that they behave in a similar way to AIS vessels? Like a lot of large commercial traffic will be transiting through an area, mm -hmm. whereas fishing vessels and pleasure craft might tend to linger in, in one space, which might make their noise profile a bit different. Um, what assumptions are you making about how non-AIS vessel traffic behaves? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it is, yeah, the assumption, especially for uh, recreational activities, they do behave a little different. Um, and I try to capture that in, in the data analysis where I try to differentiate between <clears throat> recreational vessels that are just traveling through versus the recreation vessels that are fishing and they're more like related to sport fishing activities. Um, so in fact, with JASCO's work, we differentiated between the two groups, uh, sport fishing and then just recreational boating. And we only took account uh, the recreational boating because sport fishing, it just, it, it, it's quite very. And, and I think the AIS data for recreational activities represents more that uh, traveling through, uh, not necessarily lingering an area and fishing and staying really close to say harbors or or their marinas, um, more like the vessels that, that will transit and go from you know Washington State to Alaska and, and going through BC coast. Um, but it's difficult, more, more, more study needs to be, more studies need to be, uh, need to be dedicated to, to that, understand the different type of parents and when you can apply those ratios and what not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So is there, is that the intent to continue this work with, with NASP and do additional surveys? Yes. The, yeah. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, in the North Coast, so from North Vancouver Island up to Prince Rupert, we, uh, surveys are still ongoing, not not right at the moment uh, because the aircraft is, is, is in a different area. Um, but they are, yeah, the plan is to continue collaborating with NASP and, and carry on with the surveys. Uh, hopefully, maybe we can expand to other areas, but uh, yeah, there, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, that's the plan. Is this work being done anywhere else in Canada or is it strictly a, a BC Coast uh, initiative? We did, we did some surveys out in the East Coast um, in um, uh, Bay of Fundy. Um, but uh, the East Coast NAS specifically is very busy with, especially in the summer with the uh, North Atlantic right whale and, and other tasks that they need to carry. So it, it's been tricky to get surveys ongoing there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not out of the table to, to go back and, and carry more surveys. It just, it all depends on uh, NASP and, and their other priorities. Yeah, we all know it's hard to get ship time and I'm sure it's hard to get plane time too. Yeah. 
it's a lot of lot of demand and not not very many of those those red planes. Um, the and the intention of this work is to have a better understanding of the noise profile in underwater regions. And is the primary purpose thinking about uh, marine mammals and the impacts the noise has on marine mammal activity, or are there other concerns? Uh, yes, so the work that Jessica conducted uh, for the uh, cumulative effects of marine shipping is specifically looking at the underwater noise and then how that affects um, cetaceans. So we're looking at that as well as the risk of uh, ship strikes. Um, so those are two sort of assessments that we're conducting as part of the SEMS work in, in the North Coast. Um, and that's how, you know, we're, we're collaborating uh, with NAS to, to try full, to fill in that gap with, with the non-AIS. But those are primarily the objectives right now for the data, but the data can be used for other things um, as well. Great, thanks. So I'm gonna switch over to some of our, our Q&A. We've got uh, quite a few questions coming up. So thanks everyone. I'll, I'll read those out. Um, if anybody would like to ask their questions directly, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand and be happy to, to do that, um, or if we need to uh, seek clarification. Uh, so Dave Ralston's provided a number of, of comments noting that uh, a problem is MMSI numbers are not applied for those with, uh, for those with, for with those vessels that have or use AIS. Um, having someone familiar with the area would help with vessel identification, and another problem with both satellite and VH F receive AIS receivers is mountains and loss of reception in many north and central coast areas. Um, so I, further uh, justification for including the north coast in the, the aerial surveys. Uh, we have a question from Paul Blomaris. Are you comfortable with what looks like a simple extrapolation, even though randomly perturbated, of AIS equipped behavior to non-AIS vessels? Surely having an AIS equipment is correlated with greater activity. So I think that might be a question for Jorge. I have a, yeah, I have a comment that like, uh, uh, not entirely comfortable because I, I understand like we, indeed we, what we are doing is assuming that the ones we are seeing are going with AIS are behaving exactly the same. And, and uh, yeah, you're right. It could be, could be a different situation. Like maybe a small vessel that just go fishing very locally and that doesn't have AIS. But uh, uh, yeah, at this, at this point, we just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, see, see what will be the potential impact if they do behave the same. But uh, yeah, it's a good question, and and I don't, uh, I, I don't think we have a, a solution right now for that. How how to account for the actual behavior of of, of certain vessels, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think there's any way to use more uh, data from NASP to actually like try and? pinpoint uh, different vessels as they as they move along like uh, if you as you do overflights or is there not enough data yeah. to do that oh well well i, I just one more comment I, I was talking to norma before when we were preparing this that uh, now i see a lot of papers on uh yeah you know identification of vessels but not just the type of vessel but the actual vessel so uh there there is a there is a lot of uh, image processing uh technologies coming with that so maybe that will be a, a way right like like you if you identify a non-AIS vessel but you know which vessel it is you 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 know you could have some additional information from from uh I, I don't know if they have some kind of sailing uh, uh uh log or something that tells how far they go usually or, or things like that but uh yeah that, that'll be my only comment yeah, and as, and something that I forgot to mention, we actually working with NASPA. Uh, it's it's NASPA has been uh, retrofitted with a new set of cameras and and sort of software technology that might allow us to, um, for example, get better idea of the speed of the vessel uh, and the size. Um, so those are um, my understandings that are, especially the speed are important parameters to when modeling underwater noise. Um, going down to the unique identification of the vessel and if we see the same vessel in different at different times doing different surveys that i we haven't explored a specific that but uh but it's something that yeah we can we can look at it uh uh if it will have a you know a benefit um but uh, but mostly now is just looking at how we can extract estimate speed and size and, and cover more areas um 
doing more more of these surveys more efficiently. And Paul just has another couple of comments. It seems like underway versus at anchor data from NASP might help with figuring out the vessel behavior and and some more detailed subtypes like you've mentioned previously, Norma. Yeah. Yep. Okay, moving on. Um, so Dave has a question. Uh, or maybe it's more of a comment, but I'll, I'll read it out. There's two types of traffic, those engaged in fishing, which would stay in the area during openings and those transiting through the area. The transits would consist of both local, regional, and international traffic. If the intent is to look at disruptions of marine mammal feeding, time spent in the area would also be a factor as well as locations, considering um, in relation to feeding areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good point. I usually annotate when they're, it's, it's a fishing vessel and if they're fishing um, or they're just underway. Uh, but yeah, I can't tell if the vessel is um, where it's exactly coming from. Uh, I, I, I imagine the, the major, grand majority are Canadian vessels, not, not the US ones, because those are believed they're required to carry AIS, uh, US fishing vessels. So but uh, yeah, if they're fishing, if I can see the their their gear on the water, then I they say they're fishing. Um, so I have that as well. Um, and Dave just adds an additional comment that most fishing commercial fishing happens during scheduled openings, and the data on those openings are published and accessible. So I guess maybe another consideration to bring in. Right. Right. Yeah. And we have, um, looks like we have a question from uh, Sonia Sinard about the report from JASCO, if it's publicly available. And Paula has jumped in to indicate how people can get access to that report. And Thank um, you, Paula. comment from um, Emily Haig, a brilliant talk, Norma and Jorge, really interesting findings. Do you think AIS might one day become mandatory for other vessel types like fishing or recreational vessels? I wondered if there's any talk of this within Transport Canada, et cetera, for safety and management reasons. Yeah, um, that I know of, there is no talk about expanding AIS requirements to recreational uh, vessels or small fishing vessels um but uh it's a good point because <laughs> I, I should probably know but uh, that i my understanding is there's no no not talks the other issue is technology wise there is the fear that if all these small vessels starts transmitting as that they might overwhelm the system um and so yeah that that that's another concern there is from a marine traffic uh, management point. Um, but uh, yeah, my understanding is that there is no, right now there is no, but it will be, it will be a deal. If all carry AS, then, then we know how much traffic is out there using AS data, but yeah, it's not, uh, I don't think it's as simple as that. I, I will note though that uh, the requirement for AIS was expanded fairly recently within the last uh, four to five years. And so much smaller vessels were required to carry AIS than had been required when AIS first became available. So it's, it's, uh, it is something that could change. Don't know whether it will, but uh, it has in quite recent years. Uh, going back to another question that Paul raised, did you find any examples of vessels that should be using AIS but mm -hmm. are not? No, no, I did not find any. Uh, at least that it was obvious. Again, I because I, there's no way for me to measure accurately the size of the vessel. But just from visual, it, it looked like it was the ones that were not transmitting AIS. It was, yeah, it, it made sense that they were not. Um, I didn't see any cargo vessel, um, large, large fishing vessel, a cruise ship, a, any of those vessels that I cited. Um, that were on the surveys, they all were transmitting AS. So there was no obvious triggers like, oh, that 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 is suspicious. Uh, it's not transmitting AS and it's a, obviously a very large vessel. So. Great. Uh, we have a few more comments uh, from Dave Ralston. And I'll just note that um, he indicates many remote areas lack AIS coverage, and that would be terrestrial. So. Uh, mm -hmm. depends on how far you get from shore for that one. 
um, sport fishing depends more on local availability of stocks or species of interest, especially Chinook. And pleasure tra traffic is often more focused on locations from marine mammals. So I think probably he's referring to whale watch vessels there. And I know, Norma, you've done some, some work on whale watch vessels in the past, trying to understand their, their movements without mm -hmm. AIS. Yeah, and that's exactly the group that uh, when the AIS um, was expanding the requirements for specifically to target uh, while watching, commercial while watching. So that's what the uh, greater than eight meters uh, and and carry passengers are now required to carry AIS. And, and uh, the comment about the AIS coverage. So um, just so it kind of is clear. So the, the advantage of the aerial surveys and, and is that they have an AIS trans, uh, receiver on the plane. So you get, if there is transmitting, you, if you're looking down, you will receive that message. Uh, there is less likelihood of not receiving the signal because there is a mountain or the, the coast is the coast is very rugged, just because they're overflying and they're receiving real time those those messages. So if they are transmitting, you should see it on from the from the plane. Um, so that's an advantage of those remote areas where yeah, maybe terrestrial coverage is not great. But from the air, it is. Right. Thank you. It's, it's I mean, the, the NAS plane is just packed with the different yeah. technologies and sensors. It's, it's great to have that. Um, we also have a comment here that local vessels are well recognized by local traffic. So maybe there's an opportunity to involve communities in, in vessel spotting and tracking. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we'll get into that in our next webinar, where we uh, will hear from a few communities that are using cameras on shore to track vessel activity. And uh, noting that perhaps people who are based in, in local ports um, can take pictures of the vessels to be able to supply a database and contribute to um, tracking vessels with, with uh, digital ID software. And let's see if there are any other questions. We have a question here from Nicole Jackson. Uh, you mentioned that surveys were conducted also on the East Coast. Will there be plans to do these surveys in the North, uh, Nunavut area and Lancaster Sound area in the future? E yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it, but there's currently no plans specifically, um, but uh, they could expand it there if, if there are, um, need and, and, and ask and accommodate that, that request. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's mostly just me doing this work. So uh, I'm quite busy with the, with the Pacific, but um, yeah, if there is, a, there is a need and there's more requests, uh, yeah, we can, we can definitely expand if NAS is willing to do so. That's great. And certainly there are many areas that have non-AIS vessel activity and it would be good to be able to track those as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Norma and Jorge. That's a, a really interesting presentation and sparked a lot of, of thoughts and discussion. Uh, we're going to transition over to Lily now. So I'd like to invite everybody to take a couple of minutes for a quick stretch break, grab some water. Uh, we'll get Lily set up and we will rejoin back here at, um, let's say, 10.45 or quarter to the next hour, whatever, whatever time zone you're in. So we'll get Lily set up. You want me to share my screen right now, Megan? Sure, go ahead and then we'll make sure that's up and going. That's good. Okay, perfect. Okay, I think we're all ready to go when uh, when the clock says. Oh, look, there's that plane again. Yeah. <laughs> okay, just getting.
Megan, do you see the Zoom options up here, like the participants in the video in the screen that I'm sharing? Okay, I can't hear you, but I heard you say no. Yeah, I, I only see your presentation. Or like I saw you say no. Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, we will get started again. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us for our second presentation of today. I would like to introduce you to Lily Burke. And Lily will be speaking on the topic of marine conservation areas effectiveness. And Lily is a research biologist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And she's based in Tofino and conducts field surveys, analyzes data and documents results to better understand animal abundance and distribution in marine environments. Products created are used to visualize information on patterns that we see in nature and to determine the significance of these patterns. Currently, Lily contributes to projects studying the ecology of glass sponge reefs and the use of vessel tracking methods for monitoring marine conservation areas and the development of novel monitoring methods. These results inform marine spatial planning and are used to advance applied ecology and environmental research and monitoring. Lily completed a Master of Science at the University of Victoria School of Environmental Studies. We're doing really well with University of Victoria today. It's great. So much comes out of Victoria. I'll hand over to Lily to go through her work. Uh, thank you so much, Megan. Um, I guess I need to update something online that says I don't live in Tofino anymore and I now live in Victoria. Ah, <laughs> uh, well. Victoria is good yeah, too. It is totally, um, definitely. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that I live and work on the ancestral and tra uh, traditional lands of the Wisconic people. Today, uh, like Megan mentioned, I will be sharing results from a report that looked into how vessels detected with and without AIS using aerial surveys and with satellite imagery can be used to monitor marine conservation areas in the Pacific get things set up here. So this report uh, was one publication from a project led by Josephine Iacarella and Anya Denham's program in a collaboration with Global Fishing Watch. The overall objective of this project was to advance our understanding of the prevalence of non-compliant fishing in marine protected areas before and after impl implementation and to advance our understanding of the different measurement methods used. A driving for force of this project was the expansion of marine protected areas and other marine conservation areas in response to growing national and global conservation targets. So Environment and Climate Change Canada has put together this figure that shows the proportion of area conserved in Canada from 1990 to 2022. And this light blue line on the figure shows this big jump in the percentage of marine conservation areas that have been implemented after 2015. With all of these areas being implemented, there is a need for monitoring and evaluation tools to ensure that these areas can meet their objectives. Tracking and evaluating human pressures in the marine conservation areas is necessary first to determine if the regulations are effective and second to understand the results from the ecological monitoring in these areas. Many of the human pressures that occur and are regulated within the conservation areas are associated with vessel activity and they can be monitored using uh, various vessel tracking data sets. As part of this project, members of the team conducted a national overview of the Government of Canada vessel tracking data sets. And in this process, we compiled several of the different data sets with the focus being on how we could use these data to evaluate fishing activity from 2012 to 2019. We realized though, that in addition to just looking at fishing activity, there was also a need to highlight how the data sets that collect both AIS and non-AIS vessel detections can be used for monitoring uh, marine conservation areas. Uh, specifically the radar sat satellite uh, imagery and then aerial surveillance. So that led us to this report. Uh, we wanted to be able to show vessel density and surveillance effort within and surrounding marine conservation areas of the Pacific using the satellite and aerial surve surveillance data from 2020. To do this, we reviewed the marine protected area management plans and risk assessments to identify any vessel related metrics and indicators that could demonstrate how these different data types could be used for monitoring effectiveness. We also used three case studies to examine and compare the usefulness of these data for monitoring and provided guidance on how these data could be used to monitor the different marine conservation area types. 
we examined uh, vessel data in and around 188 uh, marine conservation areas in the Pacific. All of these conservation areas had vessel-related management measures or objectives, such as vessel traffic being completely prohibited from an area or the area being closed to all or certain types of fishing activities. For the three case studies, we examined an inshore marine protected protected area, the Hecate Strait, Queen Charlotte Sound, Glass Bunch Reefs MPA, an offshore marine protected area, the Skong Kingless Bowie Seamount MPA, and then an area with an interim order to protect the southern resident killer whales, the Swisher Bank Interim Sanctuary Zone. For the vessel tracking data sets, we compiled and analyzed data from 2020 for the aerial surveys and the satellite imagery. For the aerial surveillance data, we used data collected on coastwide flyovers conducted by the Conservation and Protection Aerial Surveillance Program. The data collected on the flyovers are stored in a database in the form of multiple reports for each mission, and they provide information on the mission, the vessel detections, and the aircraft tracks. So we were able to use these reports to identify potential non-compliance with the conservation area regulations using information like the vessel's activity, the fishing gear type the vessel was using, and then the species targeted. All of the non-compliance we report is potential because details on uh, confirmed illegal activity as well as any reports on violations are classified. We also examined aerial surveillance data collected by Transport Canada as part of the National Aerial Surveillance Program, which Norma has talked about. Uh, since 2019, Transport Canada has also flown over and reported on three marine protected areas during the pollution patrols. These are the Skon Kingless Bowie Seamount MPA, the Hecate Strait Queen Charlotte Sound Glass Bunch Reefs MPA, and the Endeavour uh, Hydrothermal Events MPA. Uh, the reports are provided as text and picture attachments in emails. You can see a screenshot of that here, and they note the number of vessels within the MPA, the vessel ID and activity, and if the vessel was identified with AIS. We also examined vessel data collected by the RadarSat Imaging Satellite Program. Conservation and Protection obtained RadarSat data using a Government of Canada credit from 2017 to when the credit expired in July of 2020. These data were used to monitor vessel presence in the Skong Kingless Bowie Seamount MPA, the Heka MPA, and in the offshore area of interest. RadarSat has several imaging modes with different resolutions that can detect a range of vessel sizes depending upon the mode used. The Heka MPA was imaged in fine mode. This mode detects vessels down to 8 meters in length, while the remaining areas were captured using a beam mode that detects vessels 25 meters or larger. Since July of 2020, the Department of National Defense has provided RadarSat data at no cost to support the DFO Pacific MPA program on a non-interference basis. And this is using a beam mode that detects vessels that are 25 meters or larger. This is also around the time that the ordering switched over um, from the RadarSat 2 mission to the RadarSat Constellation mission. All of the images are, that are collected are analyzed by MDA Limited and the data are shared via email reports. Um, the data include information on the vessel observations, like the MMSI number, the time and lo the location the vessel was detected, and if the vessel was transmitting AIS. These are figures that show the surveillance effort of the three data sources in 2020. The CMP figure on the left shows the number of flyovers per 100 square kilometers, while the radar sat figure in the mid middle shows the number of satellites lost per 5 kilometer grid cell. The Transport Canada figure on the right shows the number of flyovers within the targeted marine protected areas. We found that um, the CMP had higher surveillance in the coastal populated areas, while RadarSat had higher surveillance in the offshore area, and more of the Transport Canada flyovers took place in the Hecate uh, marine protected area around here. These figures show the number of vessels detected by the three data sources in 2020. The conservation and protection radar sat figures show the number of vessels detected per 100 square kilometers, while the Transport Canada figure on the right shows the number of vessels detected within the targeted marine protected areas. We've broken up uh, the vessel detections by the CMP flyovers and radar sat into AIS and non-AIS vessel detections. So we found that uh, CMP detected more vessels overall and more vessels in conservation areas than the other two data sources. And most of these vessels were detected with AIS and in the populated coastal areas. So in this uh, Strait of Georgia, particularly around the Southern Strait of Georgia here. RadarSat uh, detected more vessels in the offshore bioregion than conservation and protection, uh, but the vessel density was lower and the number of AIS and non-AIS detections were similar. 
Most of the vessels detected uh, by Transport Canada were in the northern reef of the Hecaton protected area. The table at the top uh, provides the breakdown of the total number of vessels uh, by detected by each of the data sources, and then uh, we further divided that into the number of AIS and non-AIS vessels. Uh, next, we can look at survey effort and vessel detections per square kilometer of conservation area type. So we found that there were more vessels, which is the top panel here, and vessels per survey effort, the bottom panel here, in the Swifter Bank Interim Sanctuary Zone, in the Rockfish Conservation Areas, and in the Strait of Georgia and Howe Sound Glass Sponge Reefs. Uh, and most of these vessels were detected on the conservation and protection flyovers. Uh, we found survey effort, so the middle panel here of the figure was highest in the interim sanctuary zone and in the Strait of Georgia and Howe Sound Glass Sponge Reefs and in the Endeavour Hydrotherm Events Marine Protected Area. Very little vessels or survey effort per square kilometre took place in the other conservation area types. This table uh, shows the total vessels detected in the conservation areas by the data source, as well as the breakdown in the number of vessels by AIS and non-AIS vessels. Um, on the CMP flyovers, um, about four times as many vessels were detected compared to radar set, and this is largely driven by AIS vessel detections. The CMP data also provide information on the vessel types in the conservation areas. So this figure looks at the number of AIS and non-AIS vessels detected per square kilometer of conservation area type. We found that commercial vessels, so this uh, doesn't include fishing vessels, were detected more than any other vessel type within the conservation areas, while there were similar numbers of fishing and other and unknown vessels in the conservation areas, uh, but low numbers of all the other vessel types. 78% uh, of the vessels uh, detected on the CMP flyovers were within the rockfish conservation areas. When we look at the breakdown between AIS and non-AIS vessel detections per type, we found that most uh, commercial government research in other and unknown vessel types were AIS detections, whereas fishing and pleasure craft vessel types consisted of more non-AIS vessel detections. We can use the radar set data to provide information on vessel size. So this figure shows uh, vessel length categories from the radar set acquisitions for the AIS and non-AIS vessel detections. We found that radar set uh, detected more large vessels in the conservation areas than the small vessels. So these are the orange bars, and most of these were AIS detections. Uh, next, I'll go through the results of the case studies where we examined how these three uh, vessel tracking data sources can be used to monitor specific marine conservation area regulations or objectives. This is the Hecate Strait Marine Protected Area. In this uh, MPA, there are regulations that prohibit certain fishing activities, such as commercial bottom contact fishing and midwater trawl fishing for hake. So this figure shows uh, vessels detected by all three uh, data sources in and around the marine protected area. Both of the aerial surveys provide information on the vessel types in the area, while radar stack provides information on the vessel sizes in the area. This figure on the right here shows the number of AIS and non-AIS vessels that were detected in and around the marine protected area. So uh, the three surveillance sources detected a similar number of vessels within the marine protected area zones. This is the vertical adaptive management zone and the adaptive management zone here. Uh, CMP detected uh, more vessels without AIS, whereas RadarSat detected more vessels uh, carrying AIS um, than those without and Transport Canada uh, only observed vessels carrying AIS in and around the HECA MPA. We can use the CMP flyover data to look more closely into the vessel types detected around the HECA MPA. So this figure shows the number of AIS and non-AIS uh, vessels per vessel type in the northern, the central, and the southern reef um, that are in the marine protected area zones and in the surrounding five and 10 kilometer buffers of these zones. We found that the CMP flyovers detected more fishing vessels uh, within and surrounding the HECA MPA than any other vessel type, and most of these vessels uh, were detected in, in and around the southern reef. There were few other vessel types detected in the southern reef polygon, while all the other vessel types were observed in the northern and the central reefs. We found that uh, more commercial vessels were detected in the North Reef than any other vessel types. And when we looked into the AIS, non-AIS breakdown of vessel types, uh, we found that 93% of these commercial vessels were carrying AIS. 
We can also use the CMP flyover data to examine the activity of these fishing vessels. Um, and it, we can show that most of these fishing vessels surrounding the southern reef were recorded as fishing, while in the area surrounding the central and the northern reef, most of these vessels were recorded as uh, steaming or drifting. Moving on to the Skong Kingless Bowie Seamount Marine Protected Area. This marine protected area is close to all commercial fisheries, but other vessel activities may be carried out, such as vessel travel, tourism, and scientific research. In the management plan for this marine protected area, there are objectives specific to vessel travel, where large vessels are encouraged to transit a minimum of 50 nautical miles from the Skong Kingless Bowie Pinnacle. So that is the area in the map shown with um, in this red circle here and trends in vessel activity in and around the marine protected area are to be monitored to better understand any impacts uh, related to human activities. So we can use all three data sources to show if vessels were transiting within this 50 nautical mile area of the pinnacle. The two aerial surveys provide information on vessel types, while the radar set data um, show the different vessel lengths that were observed. Um, more vessels were detected in and around the marine this marine protected area uh, by radar sat than by the two aerial surveys, but all the three data sources um, do show vessel activity within this area. We can use the CMP flyover data to provide information on vessel trends in and, in and around the marine protected area, things like uh, vessel type, activity, and nationality. Looking at the Swisher Bank Interim Sanctuary Zone. So this is a key salmon foraging area for the Southern resident killer whales. And in 2019, an interim sanctuary zone was implemented that prohibited vessel traffic via a seasonal closure. So this is the area shown on the maps in red here. So the objective of this closure is to reduce noise and physical disturbance from vessels to killer whales in the area. In 2020, vessel traffic was prohibited in the interim sanctuary zone from June 1st to November 30th. We can use both the CMP aerial surveys and the radar sat data to identify if vessels entered this zone during the prohibited time. And we found that CMP detected vessels within the interim sanctuary zone in 2020, while radar sat did not, although vessels were detected around this zone. Since the uh, CMP flyover data are archived in a database, we were able to look at the vessel traffic numbers in the interim sanctuary zone before and after this area was closed to vessel traffic. So this figure shows uh, the vessel detections per surveillance effort in the interim sanctuary zone from January 2018 and to Dece until December of 2020. This dotted line shows the vessels observed in the interim sanctuary zone from June uh, until November of 2018. So this is the pre uh, the pre seasonal closure. The gray panels show the vessels that were detected uh, during the time of the seasonal closure from 2019 and 2020. So you can see that um, vessels per surveillance effort increased uh, during the time of this interim sanctuary zone being closed to vessels. We can also use the CMP flyovers to look into what types are entering this area during uh, the pre-seasonal closure and then during the 2019 and the 2020 seasonal closures. Uh, in this table, we identified if the data source was able to detect potential non-compliance in the conservation areas we evaluated in this report. Uh, I know the font is super small and difficult to read, uh, so please don't try. <laughs> the takeaway here are the different colors. So the red indicates that potential non-compliance was observed within the time frame. The green indicates that no potential non-compliance was observed. And the gray means that the data source was unable to evaluate compliance for the conservation area or the management measure. The column on the left here lists the different conservation types we evaluated in the report. And the middle column is the management measures, um, such as no bottom contact fishing or vessels being prohibited from an area. And the final columns on the right here are for the potential non-compliance observed by the three data sources. So we were able to evaluate compliance for all of the conservation areas included in this report using the CMP flyover data. And this is because most of the conservation areas or management measures include gear or user group specific fishing prohibitions or restrictions. So because the CMP data provides information on the vessel type, the gear and the species targeted as well as vessel activity, this information was essential in being able to evaluate potential non-compliance. 
For the three uh, marine protected areas that are targeted by Transport Canada, we were able to evaluate the management measures using uh, the Transport Canada flyover data. Uh, with the radar set data, we were only able to evaluate compliance for management measures um, related to vessels being prohibited from an area, or like with the Skong Kingless Buoy Management Plan, when vessels are encouraged to transit a certain distance from the Skong Kingless Buoy Pinnacle. We created a decision tree to identify um, the vessel tracking data source best suited to evaluate a management measure or a monitoring objective. Things like the geographic location, the size of the conservation area, and vessel-related monitoring objective will determine which data source to use. The de this decision tree currently only considers the vessel tracking data sources that we discussed in this report, but something like this could be developed further incorporating other vessel tracking data sources like AIS or vessel monitoring systems. We first organized the decision tree uh, by the management measure, so either having vessel entry being prohibited from an area or having some sort of fishing being prohibited, and then by the monitoring indicator. So. Uh, ones that look into the number of vessels or vessel presence and absence or indicators that are, are related to vessel characteristics, such as the vessel type, the gear, or the species targeted. Uh, so some of the conclusions from this report is um, are that we found these vessel tracking data sources to be effective monitoring and evaluation tools for assessing human pressures within the conservation areas and for evaluating compliance with the regulations and our guidelines. Uh, currently, historical and future data um, are being compiled and saved by single, single users for the Transport Canada uh, and radar set data, and it is important to develop a repository for these data sets. We found these data sets to be complementary and to fill in gaps from the more uh, accessible and commonly used AIS data, as uh, these data sets collect both AIS and non-AIS vessels. Most of the potential non-compliance detected within the conservation areas related to gear or user group specific fishing prohibitions. Uh, and we found that the CMP aerial surveys best evaluated the management measures that related to these fishing prohibitions, while both the CMP and radar set data uh, best evaluated the management measures regarding vessels being prohibited from entering an area. Both of the aerial surveys collect valuable uh, information on vessel activity, type and species targeted, and this information uh, was best able to determine compliance with conservation area regulations. We found that the Transport Canada aerial surveys um, can augment the other two data sets if you are assessing those targeted marine protected areas. There has been an immediate uptake in use of the protocols we developed for this report and our other product uh, publications along with the data sets and results. Um, currently, the data protocols are being used to inform DFO Ocean's quarterly surveillance reports of the protected areas in the Pacific. Uh, the data and results are being used to augment biophysical and ecological over overview reports for MPA network zone planning and are being used in the development of monitoring plans for marine protected uh, areas like the rockfish conservation areas. I think this immediate uptake of these data sources really highlights their importance and use in marine conservation area planning and monitoring. I would like to thank uh, the many people who have provided input on this initial project and who facilitated uh, the data collection and the data review, including the different managers and scientists and surveillance and enforcement officers uh, from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, as well as outside of DFO. Uh, these individuals and groups were an integral part of this project in tackling these different vessel data sets and working to understand how these data are collected, stored, and accessed was such a big undertaking, and I want to extend a huge thanks to all of these people and groups. And that is it for me. Um, here is a list of the different publications from the report and some links to access them as well. Fantastic. And I'll just note for everybody that we'll, we'll post the slides as well so that you can click on all of those links um, in due course so you can see further work uh, as you are interested. So we do have a couple of questions to start off with, and we will probably be keeping questions a little bit, a little bit briefer this time because we're just uh, don't want to cut short our, our third presenter. Um, 
but just sort of a, as a sort of high level question to start with, with doing this tracking, are you able to do it in enough real time to be able to notify vessels that they are infringing on conservation areas or issue fines or uh, interact with them in some way? Or is all of this work done considerably after the data collection? The work we did was done after the data collection, but um, I know there are other programs in DFO that are used for real-time monitoring, particularly the CMP uh, flyovers. That's mostly what they're used for is real-time monitoring. And then a lot of the conservation areas have um, like geo-referencing, geo-referencing. Geofencing? Geofencing, thank you. <laughs> And so when vessels go into an area, there's an immediate ping and somebody has sent that information. But for right. the uh, radar sat data, and um, at the time we completed the report, how the Transport Canada data were shared, uh, that is via email. So after either the flyover is done or the satellite has passed overhead and the images are analyzed. So those would be afterwards. Great. Um... We have a question from Paul Blomaris. He's raised in your your case examples, are the surveys and the radar set data for the same time frames? If so, can you explain why there is a big difference in the number of vessels detected by each method? They are some of them maybe for the same time frames and some of them may not. Um, so for a radar sat, that depends when the satellites pass overhead. Uh, since we have since Canada has switched to using images from the radar set constellation mission, I know there's more temporal coverage. So some areas are uh, imaged more than uh, twice a day, which was typically what happened with the uh, radar set two mission. Um, and the aerial surveys, they take place. I think our average was between 175 to 200 flyovers per year. Um, I think that big difference in the radar set and CMP data is driven uh, with the AIS uh, observations is driven by the difference in where they focus their efforts. So radar sat is over that offshore area. Well, the CMP flyovers are focused in where you have those um, like high density of vessel numbers around those areas where there's a lot of people or uh, different ports. And so I think it has to do a lot with the vessel traffic. Um, yeah, we've we've thoughts. seen we've done some vessel traffic mapping, and you certainly do see a lot more vessel activity closer to shore, and totally. the tracks thin out as you get a little further. Definitely, further and like the Strait of Juan de Fuca, with all the vessels going offshore, it's yeah, and that is like Quite busy. right where the flyovers take place that are all around Vancouver Island, particularly or in the in the southern Strait of Georgia there. Mm -hmm. So Paul has a quick follow-up comment. Do you have any oh, yeah. examples of where you had overlap in your, your data observations? So can you, can you do a comparison of were they capturing the same things when they were in the same place at the same time, if that happened? That is, I think that's a cool project idea. <laughs> we didn't, um, we didn't for this report, uh, but you could do it. Like with the radar set vessel acquisitions, they provide the MMSI number. So potentially you could use you could use the CMP aerial surveillance data set to cross-reference what you're observing in the radar sat one. Um, I think when I first started this project, I did look into that a little bit, but just very superficially. So it, it can be done. Um, and you could also look into things like if for our the overall project that I worked on for Josie, we um, compile data from 2012 to 2019 for the CMP flyovers and for AIS data. So you could do lots of cross-referencing to even see if vessels are turning off their uh, AIS during that time frame. Mm -hmm. That would be very interesting. Totally. Um, we have a question from Dave Ralston. Does the AIS label used by DFO CMP include both traditional AIS equipped vessels and the fishing industry's specific third-party electronic monitoring systems? Yes, um, I would have to open the data right now, but there are like a number of different columns in the data set that uh, pull out, uh, whether it's an AIS detection, detected via radar or a visual observation, as well as um, the call sign or uh, the MMSI number too. Yeah, so there's a lot, a lot of different fields um, that pull out how that vessel is detected and also um, 
the information that DFO has of it in the system. Uh, to go back briefly to how the radar set data works, you mentioned that you can monitor vessels either in extra fine mode or ship detection mode, which was eight meters or 25 meters. How do you decide which mode to use? And is there is there an extra cost if you want to go extra fine and catch more vessels? Yeah, totally. So currently uh, we receive those data on a non-interference basis. So we don't have a choice in how we receive it. Um, Typically, the vessel detection mode is the 25 meters or larger, so um, that's not what is most commonly used. When uh, Conservation and Protection was using the Government of Canada credit, um, they requested that the satellite imagery be in fine, taken in fine mode in Hecate, and this is because they wanted to look at vessel trends in and around the Hecate Moon Protected Area because that area is closer to land too, so it's more accessible to smaller vessels. Um, but as, like at the time of this report, uh, the imagery we, we were receiving was the ship detection mode of 25 meters. Um, I'm sure there are many more questions, but I think we'll have to, to wrap it up there. And, I'm sorry I um, went too long. <laughs> no, it's, it's fascinating. And there's there's just so much information. Um, I'm sure we could have spent a lot more on this topic. And really interesting to know what uh, what DFO is doing to try and keep an eye on this marine conservation areas because it's it's certainly a big question. We've got to we've got to protect a lot of the ocean before 2030. And how do we make sure that the protections are actually working? And so it's good to know that that's being looked at. So Definitely. we're going to transition over to our, our third speaker shortly. And so I'd like to invite everybody to take just, just one or two minutes to, to stretch and, and um, take a break before as we transition to Gerard's presentation. And, uh, and then we'll get started again at, uh, let's go with 11, 11, 18. So two minute break. Oh, I'll just give people one more minute and then we'll be able to get going. Thanks for hanging on so late. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope that was a good quick break. And I am delighted to welcome Gerard Dooley, an associate professor from the University of Limerick in Ireland. Gerard is the co-director at the Center for Robotics and Intelligence Systems at the University of Limerick. And he leads the University of Limerick side of the RAPID project. And we will get more into that very shortly. His research center has been has an impressive international track record in offshore and subsea, as well as aerial robotics. He is currently leading a number of research projects in the area of sensing and perception systems for field robotics. His areas of research finally primarily focus on computer vision for aerial and subsea domains with real in-field deployments in Ireland and the Atlantic. And Gerard received his training in electronic engineering from the University of Limerick. So I will hand over to Gerard now, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today, especially on short notice, just recognizing for everybody. We were meant to have James Rorden uh, from the west of Scotland University, but he was uh, had a last minute conflict. So he has 
called on Gerard to step in and present for him. So we're very grateful for, to that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much for the late notice and, and the invite, Megan. It's really interesting to see some of the other projects underway here. And I guess the, the topic and the research that we undertake at the University of Limerick is quite different to the previous speakers. And uh, what we're focused on is the deployment of autonomous systems into the ocean and also into riverways and waterways. So uh, this presentation is around risk mitigation and how we can extend robotics into uh, more difficult situations. Because if we do extend robotics offshore and even within say port areas, uh, we need to automate those systems. They need to be able to perceive the environment and to react to say risks or to react even to survey conditions. So that's what we're trying to do both in RAPID, but also within the University of Limerick Research Center that we run. So this is the consortium for uh, for the RAPID project. So it's a, it's a number of research institutions and companies from across Europe. Uh, it's funded through European Commission. And effectively the use case for RAPID was built around Hamburg Port Authority. So Hamburg Port Authority, as you can see in the center screen, has 74 kilometers of, of area that it needs to maintain and inspect on a regular basis. So they have, say, uh, teams of inspection uh, teams uh, which travel across the ports on a daily basis, and they perform surveys from ship expect inspections to uh, port uh, wall inspections to... Uh, to say uh, underwater inspections and also infrastructure such as buildings and uh, bridges. So all of these are critical infrastructure pieces. They need to be maintained and, and uh, made operational. Uh, so this is what the rapid uh, use case is built around. And what we looked at when we developed the consortium and the proposal was the elimination fully of, of any human within the survey parameters or even within the whole survey action itself. So we use a combination of both ASVs, which you can see the vessel, the small vessel, it's about a six meter vessel, and uh, drones, uh, small multi-rotor drones. So these small multi-rotor drones can fly for maybe 30, 40 minutes, but the vessel can maybe operate for two days. So we can deploy the vessel with the drone on top and we get a two day endurance because once we land back to the vessel, we swap a battery and we can take off again. So it takes maybe five minutes to swap. So we have a 40 minute survey, five minute swap, and then a 40 minute survey. And you can continually do this for the amount of batteries that you maintain on the vessel. During the interval then between surveys, the batteries recharge. So it's quite a unique system. Uh, again, this is the, the rough area that we have to operate in. And you can see there's many dangers. There's cranes, there's walls, there's trucks, there's moving pieces. So there's quite a lot of risk. Now, when you look at the offshore environment, you probably have less risk, but you still have to maintain that level of risk to the same degree. And when when it comes to risk, why are we, why are we so uh, intrigued about risk or, or concerned about it? It's really around the regulation. We can't fly drones currently within the European Union unless we're in visual line of sight. And I guess a lot of the technologies that we're developing within the university is to roll that out from visual line of sight into beyond visual line of sight as long as. So that, so that the, the embedded controller on these robots can perceive the danger and avoid danger. So do the deconfliction say between air to air targets, which would be small uh, Cessnas or search and rescue heli helicopters so that we can we can maintain the deconfliction in terms of visual, but also say uh, other deconflictions at distance and uh, separation maneuvers. Uh, there's other risk around say the operation of the ASV. So we do have collision avoidance software on TOMS and, and embedded on the ASV and the drone itself. So if you look at some of these considerations and we're only gonna have a look at some of these through, through this presentation. But how, how do we complete uh, high resolution inspection on an unknown target? So within this sphere, we could be we could be directed to a a bridge or, or turbine, especially in the offshore, it's primarily turbines or substations that we might be inspecting. 
So how do we maintain safe flight around that to be able to uh, perform close quarter inspection, but also maintain our distance in terms of safety? That's one of the considerations. How do we ensure the airspace? We've sort of touched on that. So moving from visual line of sight to having the perception on the drone so it can react to say air to air collisions or say other collisions with say infrastructure. And how do we maintain operational capacity? Well, we do this through the ASV, USV, or UAV uh, combination, and through, say, an autonomous landing system where we have a battery hotspot uh, system on board the ASV as well. So we'll have a look at this. This is one of the demonstration areas that we used uh, during one of the demonstrations for the rapid project. And as you can see, we, we're, we're deemed, our target is maybe to get maybe 0.2 millimeter GSD resolution across that whole uh, port area. And it's hard to do that when you have, say, uh, poles and lighting fixtures that go up maybe 20 meters. You know, so if I was doing that as a man survey, I would uh, turn up on site and say, what's the highest target or, or danger within my area, which is maybe 20, 25 meters. I'd add 10, 15 meters on it. I'd say my survey can only do it 40 meters. However, we can do smarter surveys if we if we do say multiple stages and we use some smart path planning between that. This is your typical survey for say what I've talked about, a manual based survey. And it's a lot more pattern. Some of you might be familiar with this. It's your typical survey for bathymetric survey as well. So you're going between points and it's fully automated. You can do this with your typical DJI drone or, or other off the shelf drone that you get. But as I said, you generally fly 15, 20 meters above the uh, highest risk target and you're not getting uh, good data sets then. You're not getting close quarter operations and you're not getting say uniform GSD across the whole um, area. So we developed a two stage workflow where first we do a high level survey at say 50 or 100 meters. And then we use the mesh. So we use the 3D environment that we generate from that first survey to generate map, and then we generate a close quarter path plan around that. Effectively, what we're doing is we're creating a map of the area, and then we're doing a close quarter path plan, which is maybe maintained three to four meters from every target within that uh, within that sphere. So this is what we do. This is the deployments we do. We're using off the shelf DJI uh, drones, which is the M300 platform that we use, and this will fly for maybe 35 minutes. And we do two embedded controllers. We do one embedded controller, which sits on the drone. So we do an integration onto the drone itself. We do a software development kit integration between the drone and our embedded computer. And then we're continuously sending commands to the drone. So waypoint commands, stop commands, descend commands, and whatnot. Uh, the second one is we do uh, uh, an MSDK, which is a mobile app, which sits on the DJI controller and sort of runs that from the controller itself. So we do one embedded, which is on the drone, and it's the second one, which can be run, say, over a cloud-based system. So this is the workflow. We do on the left-hand side a 2D survey, and then we do a 3D path plan from that survey. And you can see, if you look at this path plan here, you can see sort of the lines that it takes are really just inter interwoven between each of those uh, light fittings. Uh, this is the first, say, higher survey area mesh that we get. And then when we do the second close quarter survey, we can determine our distance. So you can get down to, say, 0.1 millimeter GSD. Or for this case, I think this is maybe a 0.5 millimeter or 0.6 millimeter GSD resolution. So you get very uh, good resolutions is 0.7. So first stage takes about three minutes flight, seven minute processing. And second stage is about 12 minute flight with about 60 minute processing to complete these maps. Uh, the second, uh, say, BV loss mitigation strategy we're gonna look at is airspace deconfliction. So when we look at airspace, and again, it's, it, it's the same with the offshore. Where we saw earlier on a lot of the previous presentations, there is quite a need to survey our offshore uh, areas both from, say, an environmental aspect that we saw, but also in terms of, say, uh, getting legislation or getting permissions to deploy infrastructure. So in terms of the large-scale rollout of offshore wind off our coast in, in Ireland, but also what's happening across the globe, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure going out. that has to be maintained, inspected on a regular interface. 
But it also, there has to be baseline surveys going in before, so pre pre construction. This includes both uh, bird surveys, mammal surveys, and there's a whole host of other surveys that you might perform in times of offshore wind. Uh, all of these can be performed with autonomous systems. They don't need to have large, expensive, and CO2 producing aircraft off our coast. So we're looking at, say, driving this and moving into BV loss mitigation or BV loss flight. In terms of mitigation, then, where we talk about deconfliction. Uh, in an aircraft, you have, say, mode C transponders, you have air traffic control. So you have a lot of tried and tested systems. For autonomous systems, we're moving to what's known as unmanned traffic management system. This is a cloud-based or satellite-based software uh, system that communicates with the drones, and it performs the separation, which is, which is uh, say, a long-scale deconfliction. But we also need to have, say, pilot eyes. We need to have a replacement for the visual line of sight. So we do this through what's known as detect and avoid systems. In terms of detect and avoid systems, we can use different cameras such as RGB, thermal, lighter, and radar. It was interesting, some of the first speaker there, uh, a lot of what you showed is thermal imaging. And the reason being is you can see farther, you can see clearer. So we actually we actually determined that the thermal imager was the way to go for detecting the voice systems. Because we can see further, we can see a system maybe up to four or five kilometers away. Where with an RGB a normal camera, maybe we're getting down to a couple of hundred meters. And when you when you develop machine learning algorithms, which is you're making the, the machine, the embedded computer, decide where the incursion is, what's it seeing, if there is an incursion. It's the clearer you can make that imagery, the easier it is for the machine learning algorithm to act and to make a good decision. So we do development and tests. It's on the east coast of Ireland. This is generally where we fly. It's in a it's in a training area. It's in an enclosed airspace. So we often have Cessnas and small aircraft doing touch and land operations. Uh, this is one of the flights that we would have developed in the first stage of the rapid system. So you can see the plane and the center screen uh, of the RGB image. And then you can see it a bit clearer on the on the right hand side. And you can see our algorithm is working there. There's a boat on the sea surface there. You probably didn't see it on the RGB and the plane. So it picks it up. But one thing is you saw it, it, it decided the boat was a plane. And at later stages, it decides some of the birds are flying in front of the, the face of the camera. They're also planes. So effectively, all we're doing is we're, we're determining uh, a couple of pixels at distance, which are higher intensity or higher temperature than the surrounding background is a plane. So to develop this further, what we did is we included, say, an optical flow estimation. So this estimates as well. Uh, the speed of the target. So we use optical flow and say a uh, machine learning algorithm and we use a bunch of weightings and another algorithm and we combine all of that into a system. And the system then, as you can see, that's flying up in the top left, this system is 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 more smart. So this one can detect say birds, ships and helicopters or even Cessnas. So there's, there's quite a, uh, uh, there's a number of classes that it can, it can monitor. And it can it can detect these at distance. And what's interesting as well, it'd be interesting to see even some of that data, some of the system that we've developed, uh, might be able to detect the ships from distance, say from some of them uh, survey planes. Uh, this is if you see on the bottom left here, this is some of the pop plans that we did for this helicopter. So we rented a helicopter, we asked the helicopter to fly uh, these patterns, and then we recorded the output from our detect and avoid systems. Uh, this is, I guess, the the furthest point is around here. So when you're looking here, the RGB at three kilometers is very difficult to see anything. But you can see our system, it, it works quite well. It's still tracking. It's still telling us that there's an incursion there. And it's about incursion. Our system works out to three kilometers currently, but we're developing that system that we think will even go out to maybe four or five kilometers. So that, that mitigates the detect and avoid, that mitigates, say, if some other object comes into our airspace, we have enough time to react and descend. And it, the, the computer on board makes those decisions and it automatically outputs those commands through the S SDK system uh, to the drone and completes that uh, collision avoidance. 
The third part we're going to look at is how do we maintain operational capacity? Well, we use a battery hot swap system and we use an automatic uh, landing system. For the automatic landing system, we use, say, an embedded Aruku, where there's a number of Arukus embedded within one. This is known as a fractal-based marker. And this is just a setup we would have tested and developed. So you can see our drone in the top right. This is our embedded compute here. This is the landing platform. And we have a GPS also for the landing system. So the GPS of the landing system, when, is, when it is on, the ASV is going to move. But we translate the, that through the ground control software for the drone. So the drone can read off that information, where the ASV is, where the moving target is. It moves then to that target. It moves to the target. It, it then switches from uh, absolute base position into relative base position. And why it does this is accuracy. So we need more accuracy in terms of the pose estimation uh, for the autonomous landing. So when we get close to the drone, say 50 meters, uh, we can we can easily track this. And we're moving them between different zoom levels of the camera, which is embedded on the drone, and also the different Arukus, uh, which are embedded on the, the landing system. So we'll just skip this because I have a better video. Effectively, it lands. And then this one is just a quick overview of the system itself. So this would have been the last demo we completed maybe uh, two or three months ago. So what we're doing in Rapid is we're replacing um, a lot of manual processes and procedures that are used in, for example, bridge inspection with autonomous routes of action. And we also get to play with some robotics, get some cool videos and footage out for it. So the demo would have been done in Hamburg uh, back in end of July this year. This is that demo. That's the ASV that we're using. It's about a six meter ASV. So stage one, we take off automatically. And all of this survey from start to finish when the ASV moves into position is done without a human in the loop. So it's all fully automated. And it's moving into, say, offshore operations where you don't have good comms or, say, more risky operations where you need the robot to react faster than what a human can do. So this is the autonomous landing system. You can see we actually slow down the video for the land, so it's quite fast. And we do that to be able to uh, mitigate against, say, roll and pitch of the vessel. Obviously, in a port setting, there's not going to be much roll and pitch. But when we move to offshore, then it's going to be more, more contentious. Yeah. So this is a path plan. You can see 3D path plan going around all the, the obstructions. And then that's the execution of the path plan. If you could think, if we have to survey a turbine offshore or some asset offshore, it becomes very useful to be able to do that in a safe manner. We also use close quarter detect and avoid. So that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at SLAM systems in terms of GPS uh, denied areas, and we do some automated crack detection systems. So once we register when the cracks are, we do a closer quarter inspection on those cracks. And you maybe get down to say 0.1 millimeter GSD then from that output. So that's rapid, I guess. We've also done, we're also trying to transition across into a lot of offshore operations. So to use the same technology in terms of offshore, and we're using machine learning algorithms then to detect, say, bird species, mammal species, uh, to be able to do zoom. So instead of using a high, heavy payload for birds, uh, bird survey off the shore, we use, say, a dual payload system. First to detect where the bird is, and then the second one to zoom in. That would be similar to say the search and rescue or the survey uh, footage that you would have saw in the first presentation. So we're using this infrastructure here to do our survey. And again, we're using autonomous landing systems to land the drone in a safe manner.
I think that's like uh, Game of Thrones music or something. So this is early stages of our bird detection algorithms. So again, we're, we, we were looking at thermal imaging for birds. We've actually moved away from that. We're looking at multispectral systems or maybe just RGB cameras. We do reconstruction as well. So you can do, once you do reconstruction, it doesn't have to be a static target. It can be a moving target such as a ship. So this is one of the reconstructions we did of the vessel. You can see the accuracies then in terms of uh, mesh, but also in terms of the visual. So the it, it's quite accurate. And then the offshore platform, which is a lighthouse. Again, this is digital twin 3D reconstruction of the lighthouse. And we can use the footage, which would be photos, or the reconstruction also to look for defects or, or to look for issues around the infrastructure. Where, where is this all going? I guess where we're looking at is replacement or expansion. We, most, most nations in the world, including Ireland, we put a lot of money into research vessels and surveying the ocean. We're not doing enough in terms of climate action. We need to have more vessels out there, but they're significantly costly. They they burn a lot of fuel, there's safety concerns and whatnot. It's easily replaced them. You know, there's a new robotic kind of output in terms of large offshore vessels that are autonomous. This one's a 10 meter vessel. It can travel for 25 days endurance and it can travel say 3000 nautical miles. So in terms of your, your uh, your marine protection areas, you know, we can have these on on standby within MPAs or whatnot for upwards of maybe 20 days and then a couple of days for transit in and out. You can fly your drones off these. You can have tethered drones. You can have uh, multi-beam acoustic systems. You can have AUV systems. So the expansion for uh, autonomous ASV systems are very similar to, say, your, your, your research vessel. However, you know, these are built for robotics. So the integration, the interfaces between say your ROV and your ASV or your ROV and your, your AUV or your ROV or your ASV and your, your, your drone, it's, it's, it's built for that. So they, they operate quite, quite well together. Uh, this is another system that we're developing and working with. This is a long range drone system. So this one would have RGB thermal sensors. It has payload systems that you would have seen on the first presentation on the search and rescue systems. And uh, this one can fly for six hours. So we can fly upwards of say 500 kilometers. Now in terms of your output, you might fly 200 kilometers out, 200 kilometers back and have 100 kilometers in spare capacity. This one actually takes off vertically. So where we're using it is actually for vessels. We take off from a vessel, uh, we do a survey, which could be an hour, which is 100 kilometers, and then we return back to the vessel. We're using autonomous landing systems again for this. And again, in the future, we're looking to expand this maybe to maybe 15 meter ASVs and have these land on ASVs. So you take off vertically, and what it's actually doing here is flying on battery. And it switches then, it switches to a petrol-based system. We burn one liter of fuel in an hour, which is quite different to, say, your traditional search and rescue helicopters or Cessnas or whatnot. And then we can fly upwards of, say, 8,000 feet. So you can see we're just getting airborne there. And you can see the VTOL motors on the FPV there have shut down. So you're just on on, on your, your forward flight now. So you're in traditional uh, fixed-wing flight. And you can see the footprint of this. You can have the same sensors uh, generally that you do have on, on larger survey uh, aircraft for offshore. Like the sensor technologies have come a long way as well. We can do, say, bathymetric LiDAR systems, LiDARs, RGBs, uh, thermal, uh, multispectral, hyperspectral. So there's a lot of technologies that can easily be embedded into these drones. And then when we come back to shore or we come back to ship, we just do the reverse. We start up our VTOL system, which is battery based. Uh, we shut down the main engine and then we're landing. 
the autonomous landing system is the same system that we developed for the multi-rotor. So that's me. That's the project. Uh, happy to take questions and see uh, see what the what the thoughts are. Thank you so much, Dara. That was that was a lot of information, but fantastic. And as you've noted, many, many potential applications. And we're actually going to delve more into the offshore autonomous vessels in a session in a few weeks time from now when we get into water-based systems. But great to have a preview of the work that, um, that you're doing there as well. We have a question from James Spencer. Uh, can you fly your thermal detect and avoid payload at the same time as your inspection payload? Yeah. So the, the thermal uh, detect and avoid systems, a lot of what the industry are trying to look at it are radar systems, which weigh maybe 20 kg. Our thermal camera weighs, you know, it's 50 grams. So it's easy to embed that and run that with the with the embedded compute. The embedded compute, again, you're maybe looking at 100 grams or maybe your batteries and everything. Your, your all-up system is maybe 200 grams. So it's quite lightweight. It easily interfaces onto these drones. And yeah, your inspection system then is dependent on what you're doing, whether you want thermal for inspection, RGB or some lighter system. Generally, our payload systems are maybe, you know, one, one and a half kgs. So your your thermal, your detecting void is, is 200 grams, whereas your payloads are maybe one, one and a half kg. I wanted to go back to where you were showing us the video of the uh, the ship lock inspection, and you mentioned that you know you you scan it through your your three D flight path, uh, getting close up but not hitting anything, and then once the drone registers that there is a crack, um, you can then go in and do a closer inspection. Is it the drone that's making that decision to go in, or is a person helping with that? Yeah. So the the crack detection algorithm uh, will output a list of waypoints. So those waypoints, then we will know the position of them. And then we just return to those positions and do a coast to quarter inspection on them. Now, some, some parameters will be input by the user. You know, the initial survey area, which is a, a box, we need the four co coordinates of that. Where do you want a survey? We also need to know, say, the GSD that you want. So the initial, uh, say, full area GSD, it's typically maybe one one millimeter and then maybe the final crack detection GSC could be 0.1 millimeter. So you know that those GSDs and those parameters will determine where we fly for the box obviously, but also say how close we get to the target. Wait we I think 0.1 GSD is about the limit of the system. We're we're three meters from target when we're 0.1 GSD. So we we can actually do uh, a different lens if you want to go further again, but you know, I think 0.1 GSC is about is about all you need really for infrastructure monitoring. It it does seem quite uh, quite good resolution. Well, I want to recognize that we've reached the end of our time today, and thank you so much for joining us. And and uh, you know, it's a bit late for you, but I appreciate your taking the the time to share all this um, amazing work that you've been doing with us and. Um, very grateful to all of our presenters to speak today and share their knowledge with us. And then also thank you to everyone for your, your many questions and participation in this webinar. As said before, we will have the slides posted um, and available along with the recordings. And I will send out a note to everybody when that those are available so you can download. And the next session in this webinar series is going to be Thursday, October 19th, again at 10 a.m. Pacific. And we'll be looking at applications of shore-based technology, such as cameras. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you all for joining us today.